Welcome to our very first live edition of our new segment on the Crossboard Interviews. That is Point of Order, where we will be diving into some of the biggest topics of the week here on the Crossboard Interviews. And we'll be doing it live with a guest and we'll be bringing her on here in a few seconds. But I want to just mention right off the top of the bat that this is live uh, you can watch it live Wednesday, but if you like to listen to the audio version, because it seems like more people like to do that, but we will be bringing more people here to YouTube. Uh, you can catch it every Friday at 8 o'clock. It will be a part of our regular rotation of the Crossboard interview. So live Wednesday night from 7.45 to 8.30, 9 o'clock, depending on how long we like to chat. And then it will be the audio version of the show will be live or sort of released on Friday morning. So without further ado, I want to welcome on to our show for the third time. She is a friend of the show. I'm glad that she's willing to come on and talk politics with me for a few weeks. Uh, Miss Sarah Biggs. Sarah, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. Well, thanks for having me back. I'm glad I made it back on the rotation. <laughs> you will always be welcome back to the rotation because I'm always happy to have you on the show because you bring an insightful look to many issues that are uh, plaguing this province, this city, this country. Try. <laughs> <laughs> you try and that's all that matters. So how this is going to work for those who are listening to this on Friday, for those who are watching this now, is we, the my guest Sarah and I, have discussed what we're going to talk about and then we're going to dive into it. And this is going to be a little bit different than our traditional uh, politics segment that we do at the end of the month because this is going to be a uh, cordial conversation between two people or more and we're going to discuss the issues and we're going to just be blunt about it from time to time. We're not going to attack anyone. We don't think that that brings anything to the political conversation, but we will give our honest takes. And that's all it is, is our honest takes. So Sarah, I'm looking forward to uh, growing our budding media relationship that we have here into a ever evolving political relationship. Thanks, Chris. Me too. <laughs> So I, I, we have to start off with the biggest news story, not here in Canada, but down south. And that is the draft opinion by uh, the Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito overturning Roe versus Wade. Now, before we get into it, I want to preempt this by saying this is a draft opinion. It is not the law of the land yet. It is a draft that has been leaked to Politico, and it is the law of the land until the opinion is passed. So until then, everything is the same, but we are seeing what is coming. I, 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 I will be the man in the room by saying I have no comments on this because I sh believe I should be listening to people like yourself, Sarah, women across the land on their opinions. So Sarah, when you heard this news, like everyone else Monday night, what was your first initial thought? I think the word that came out of my mouth was shit. Uh, so, so what we need to realize is that a lot that has been happening in the United States right now seems to be overflowing or spilling over in Canada, um, especially in the Western provinces. We're seeing that there's a shift between conservatism and populism. We're seeing that, uh, you know, the center is struggling to define themselves. The left is really trying to consolidate everything left of the center dial. It's It's been a difficult week. So as you know, I'm um, the lobbyist, um, on the case for Bill 17 for uh, the bereavement leave to include uh, individuals are experiencing uh, law, uh, loss of pregnancy. So it made our week a little bit more, it, a little bit more spicy, I would say. If we So what's happening right now is that Roe v. Wade is law of the land, but we need to remember, so Roe v. Wade is essential, but what's happening is that that law was based on privacy. It was not based on the right to have an abortion. So we need to keep that in mind. 
So since 1973, the Conservatives or the GOP have been working extremely hard and placing their pawns um, to really try to align as and appoint as many judges as they can to be able to reverse Roe v. Wade. Now, what does that mean? It has multiple implications. I'm just gonna give a little context for the United States. So there's, I would say about a third of those states that um, do not have trigger laws. So, and the remainder of those states have trigger laws. So a trigger law is, it's unfortunately, it's very unfortunate that they name it that way, but it's a law that would explicitly ban abortion in states that have that law in place when Roe v. Wade would be reversed. So there's a lot happening right now. Um, so, you know, would the, so I don't call the, um, you know, and I would say that I call the pro-life movement pro-birth. They are not pro-life, they are pro-forced birth. No matter what happens to you, you are bound to give birth to the child that has been conceived, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the issue is, no matter if um, the child will have, um, you know, major physical disabilities and all that, it does not matter. You are being forced to give birth to that child. So we're looking at a lot of states where there's low income, education is poor, women will be, um, you know, really impacted by this. They will, I would almost consider it like being, they would be held hostage of their own right to choose, their right to, of choice by the states where they're going to be living. And there's always something that resonated with me with, um, you know, a lot of people miss Ruth Bader Ginsburg these days. And, you know, there's always something, there's something that she said when she appeared in front of the Supreme Court. And she said that, she quoted, I ask no favor for my sex. All I ask is for our brethren to take their feet off our necks. A lot of women in those states will not be allowed to breathe. They will not be allowed. We know that there's, um, you know, there's much, much, much increased risks um, with, um, you know, BIPOC women to complicated pregnancies, um, death after pregnancies, very post-birth complications, um, high-risk pregnancy. It's an extremely, extremely uh, difficult issue to deal with, especially when you are in a country where healthcare is not accessible to all. Yeah, That's think, another layer yeah. that we're facing with. So there's a lot of layers. So that's why we're at. It's not great. Um, you know, the, and uh, um, one thing that I heard over and over again since Monday was this isn't going to stop abortions. This is not going no. to stop abortions. As much as people, uh, the people on the right might think that uh, abortions may end the day that Roe versus Wade gets overturned, it's all that it is doing is stopping safe abortions. And I know yeah. there's people probably going to listen to this or watch this who are going to send me hate mail. I, I That's appreciate fine. it. Send it to I me. I got some this way. Exactly. I will file it away in the appropriate location, as I've done with all the other hate mail I've gotten over the few last few years I've done this show. <laughs> yeah, it's it's extremely difficult. And, you know, especially when we're trying to push. So we are living in the most conservative province in the country. And especially when you are trying to. So the timing is odd right before Mother's Day. Uh, the timing is odd for us because we are trying to get Bill 7, 17 through the finish line. Um, it took a lot of work to explain on, you know, all loss of pregnancies are valid and we do not want individuals, birthing individuals to be impacted in the workplace, um, you know, discrimination or retaliation or name it, anything that could negatively impact the employee. We just want to make sure that they feel empowered. It's like when you go to your employer, you're like, well, I have cancer. 
they're like, okay, they're not going to ask you what kind of cancer you have. They're going to let you it. Haven't up met some to of you. my uh, my former employees. Well, then. maybe. <laughs> But usually it's like, I have cancer. It's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And then you you let the person disclose. Well, you know how it is. You let the person disclose if they wish to do so, right? We have that courtesy that we're giving to those individuals. So why would it be different from someone grieving the loss of a pregnancy? And I appreciate and the I'm work that you're doing with the organization that you're representing. Um, it is a challenge in a in a normal day with the news that was dropped on Monday. I can imagine your week went from being semi bad to oh crap, this is gonna like shoot me in the foot here. <laughs> I, I would like to say that you know the the cat meme that just goes like this, the gif, yeah. the cat that goes like this. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's how I felt all week. I was sick. I was not feeling well. My kids were sick. And I was just like, let's go. <laughs> let's do um, this. But you mentioned at the top of the show, and I want to dive a little bit into it uh, here, um, that what happens down in the States has the tendency to spill over here in on, uh, in Canada. And um, that that is seen relatively quickly Tuesday morning I think every progressive leader found the closest microphone that they could find and stepped up and they attacked the conservatives or a governing governing party I have never seen more NDP liberal politicians find a microphone find a microphone so fast than they did on Tuesday morning but the flip side to that is, Candace Bergen, the leader of the opposition, the interim leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, released a statement to all yeah. caucus members of the Conservative Party of Canada saying, do not comment on this, do not mention anything. In a one sentence, it was obtained by CTV. And that didn't stop the leadership candidates from voicing their opinion on... Uh, Mr. Dalton was the first one. Mr. Dalton, who is no longer a leadership candidate, was the first one to come out and say his opinion on it. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, you know, I, I was Do you monitoring... Think this, I'm going to ask you this question, because I, you, I, as, the, as the liberal and conservative in the room, and sort of the right mm -hmm. versus left here... Um, do well, you I'm... I think we're, we're both center. I think you're. We're both. I think center. we're both center with conservative tendencies. Exactly. Put it that way. While this is news today, yeah, the official uh, opinion will be released at the end of the Supreme Court term, which is in June or July. This is yeah. when conservatives are voting and getting their votes. Is it safe for all the conservatives now to come out and say what their position on Roe versus Wade is? Because we saw uh, Scott Atkinson, we saw John Charest, we saw Roman Babert, we saw Leslie Lewis come out with the kind of an announcement, but without an announcement because she says she doesn't want to talk about her parental plan. Yeah. yeah. And then we saw John Charest come out saying he's pro choice, he would uh, allow free votes, but he would always vote against it. Um, the only one who hasn't said anything and has not made any mention is Pierre Polyver. Um, now, with it being so far away from when uh, members are voting, would it not be easier for Pierre to just come out now and say something about it instead of waiting until Roe versus Wade is overturned in the States and then having to go on record in June or July when people are starting to vote? or taking you know into consideration some candidates and starting to cross them off their list. So here's a thing that the Conservative Party, I personally believe needs to understand is that there's more conservative women out there in favor of abortion than people could imagine. So I well, think you saw someone like uh, Michelle Rempel Gardner come out today, and I apologize for interrupting on, on this yeah, important yeah. issue. But you saw Michelle Rempel Gardner come out and gave a strong endorsement to say, We're going to fight uh, to my two daughters down in the States, uh, her uh, daughter in laws from her wet, uh, marriage. So, this, I agree with you that there's more women, uh, conservative women out oh. there that are in the pro uh, choice camp than the pro life camp. We look at Kristen Rowworth. We look at 
um, you know, some chief of staff in the current UCP government, I'm not going to name them, um, but some chief of staff are, you know, for and supportive of abortion for the right reasons, I would say, um, which is any reason at all, really, it's a women's choice. I need to, sorry, I, I, I don't know why I need, I need, I, like, I feel to reiterate that. It's just so, such a basic concept and a lot of um, male conservatives do not grasp. Um, it's gonna be, I think it would have been wiser uh, for everyone to come up extremely strong on their opinion so we know what we are dealing with instead of trying to, you know, figure out what the back the backstage agenda is. Um, you know, I'm always, I'm someone that believes in, you know, it's important to come up strong and true to who you are, like Miss Lewis did this week. She presented a plan that was true to her views and her opinions, but hearing crickets on such an important issue, my dudes, I do not have good words right now for whomever's remain silent. It's unfortunate. It's extremely unfortunate. And the, it, at the end of the day, they think it's a political, probably a political calculation to stay silent instead of saying something, but and it's uh, not. No, it's not. Because I agree. They think that they think that we do not follow what is happening, that we are not closely watching, but we are. Yeah. And, you know, if, and we need to come to realization that if the conservative party wants to become electable again, they need to focus on issues such as environment, women issues, women's health, uh, trans rights, you know, LGBTQ2S plus, everything they need to upgrade to 2022 is what I would like to say. They need a serious software upgrade. If not, I'm worrying that with all, because uh, the hot topics right now are environment, women's health. Those are the two biggest topics right now in the news. Do you think that's true though? Because I look at Twitter and I know Twitter is an echo chamber of people yeah. just shooting their mouth off and hoping for the best. But do you honestly think that the average voter out there right now thinks that the top two issues right now are the environment and women's issues or not, the, or important issues? I shouldn't should say top no. two issues because I think the top well, no, issues No, I was right talking the top two issues in the news right now, the not news. the top two. Okay. Yes, sorry. I should have specified in the news. Um, there's First Nation, there's reconciliation, there's, yeah. you know... Uh, federal transfer equalization, there's, the list is about five foot long, but I would say in the news right now in current affairs, um, you know, those two, but a lot of the conservative individuals I talk to are more and more interested into environmental issues and they're starting to click, um, you know, I think that there's a click happening and people are like, oh shit, we really need to start doing something. We're going to have our conservatives, conservatives that, you know, no matter what happens, doesn't matter. We need to take the oil out. But I think that it's becoming more tamed and a more poised conversation, I would say, less triggering, more thinking. And really, we're starting to be able to have a really, really interesting conversation what's happening. While I'm just cautious of time here, I just want to make sure that we talk about the big subject. And that is the conservative yeah. leadership race. Um, yes. We've mentioned them already a bit here, but I want to dive into a little bit about the candidates. There are six yeah. candidates. I think there was at one time 15 or 13 or there was a large amount of people running. 15 and 27 I believe, and okay. 14 and 19, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, well, I, well, there was four in 2020. 2019, mm -hmm. everyone and their mother seemed to... 2019, everyone... Or 2017, everyone and their mother seemed to have ran. But 2021, yeah. there are six candidates. They are Perry Sand Muskoka MP Scott Atkinson. If I'm pronouncing his name wrong, I do apologize right now. 
former Ontario independent MPP because the writ was called, so therefore he's no longer an MPP in the province of Ontario, uh, Roman Baber. Uh, we have MP for Haldeman North Fork, who is Leslin, Dr. Leslin Lewis, MP for uh, Carlton, yes, uh, Pierre Polyver, former Quebec Premier John Charest, and I'm just trying to make sure I got them all, and Brampton Mayor. Patrick Brown, former Mr. conservative Brown. MP. Um, now, I have tried to make it out to every single event that a leadership candidate has had here in the pro in the yeah. in Calgary. The only one who I haven't is because he flew in and then flew out was Patrick Brown. But I am finding this leadership race. I'm kind of. I'm going to say this, and I'm not. Kind of, I'm not. I'm not trying to be rude to anyone. It's kind of a dud. And that's just me. I'm a political observer and I'm watching and I'm going, okay, I'm seeing Pierre do his thing. I'm doing, I see John Charest doing his stuff. Scott doesn't seem to be doing much on social media. I don't think he's doing events west of Ontario until he gets out here for the leadership yeah. uh, debate on uh, the 11th. Patrick Brown has got this fly under the radar, not talking to media concept. And Roman, God bless him, he came up to me when I was at his event and he shook my hand and he was so happy to see me. And Leslin Lewis, she brought out the crowds. What's your initial take on this leadership race? It's early. It's still so early. Everybody, so here's, everybody's like, oh, Podiev is bringing the crowds, he's bringing this and bringing that. But if we are looking at the, at the numbers, if we are looking at the fundraising numbers, the advantage Mr. Poliev has on Jean Charest is about $55,000 right now mm -hmm. as of March for Q1. So as of March 31st. So there's going to be like two more months added to the. And Jean Charest like, was only a candidate for two weeks in March. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jean Charest took forever to announce one day it was going, the other day it was not. Everything was always pending. It's, you know, it was like, you just sit back and you wait. That's what happens because um, I know for a fact that Mr. Charest's spouse is um, has a big presence in his political life decisions, and he respects his um, his wife's Mrs. Charest's opinion, which is I think is great. Um, and that's how you know how things should work in a partnership when somebody wants to run or you know do something, but. It took forever. Mr. Poryev probably worked in the background for a while, so he announced like as soon as the <laughs> the trigger was. Pulled. I don't think the body was cold of Aaron O'Toole, but before he announced, <laughs> like it was Tuesday, no. Aaron O'Toole got kicked out. Saturday, he went, "Hey guys, I'm running." Wait, what? Yeah. So it's gonna be to see. Gonna be too interesting to see what is going to happen with his race, um, because we all know that he remove himself from the 20 was it 2020 2020, yes, 2020. both Sheree and Polyver Poly, Polyev Polyev decided Polyev. to Polyev Polyev uh, both Polyev. had literally if I remember the day that they were both going to announce because if I'm not mistaken it was the exact same day or day like Sunday Pierre was going to announce Monday John was going to announce YouTube leaked the video of John Stray announcing he was running. Pierre yeah. had like the venue booked. He had every he had the signs made, and then he said, "No, I'm not going to run." And then this kind of seems like it's the race that we should have got in 2017. To be honest, so you know, there's a lot of talk, but. What's important is always to keep an eye on the financials and on the numbers. So, you know, Mr. Poliev attracts a certain type of conservatives. Mr. Charest attracts another one. Miss um, Lewis attracts another crowd in the conservative spectrum. Everybody has their own niche. So what is going to happen is that I'm suspecting that, you know, so it is early in the race. It does advantage some candidates and disadvantages some candidates might be losing some steam might be some might be gaining steam as well because let's remember we're may june 
July, August, we're five months away from the vote almost at the day. So, and we don't have any debates yet, but what's going to be interesting this time is that there's only six candidates. There's not going to be 14 plus Maxim Bernier just really trying to try to make a point within 25 seconds because there's so many people on stage that you can't really have, you know, a formed opinion voiced during a debate. So it's going to be very interesting to see what is going to happen next week. So I'm saying it's early. It might be look like a dud right now, but I think that the campaign is going to be gaining steam. <laughs> like I would say, usually a typical voter starts paying attention 10 to 14 days before an election comes. So what we're going to see is that in August, July, August, that's when the train's going to really be gaining some steam and we're going to see some serious because we're not going to be dealing with um you know federal election in alberta there's in theory it shouldn't be an early election but we don't know because there's a leadership review coming up and god knows what's going to happen after then we have the ontario election and it's going to be uh in the month and then quebec is going into election but only in october i believe it's October 2nd, their election is. So all of September, okay. their election is going to be called. So everyone's going to yeah. be looking at what's happening in Quebec. And this is what oh. I found interesting about what's happening with this leadership race. This is going to be a very fly under the radar leadership race because the membership cutoff happen- ends in June for when you yeah. have to buy a membership to vote. The, yes. the Ontario election is going to take out all attention from any conservative leadership candidate over the next four weeks, which is going to hurt a lot of the candidates who are relatively unknown. And by that, I mean the sort of the lesser known candidates, the one who aren't on the names like Patrick Brown, John Charest, Pierre. Yeah. So that's going to hurt them in the long run. Then it's going to hurt only in Ontario. Do you think we, so? If they're smart, they're going to be working out West yeah. while the Ontario thing is happening. If their strategists are smart about it, but that's not a debate. But, but, but if the I thing is, down, you can't win the leadership without Ontario and Quebec. So you kind of need yeah. to be in Ontario and Quebec because for those who don't know, the, the way that the conservatives vote is yeah. they divide all 338 ridings up into 100 points each based on how many memberships yeah. you have. If, you're, you're elect, if your riding has 20 uh, members, you have 100 points. And if your riding has 20,000 members, you still get 100 points. They add them all together. It's a very weird concept. It's the strangest uh, leadership election I've ever heard, barring the conservatives in UK, but that's here nor there. I... You need Ontario and Quebec to win the leadership race. You cannot win with just on Alberta, Saskatchewan, and part of BC. So it's kind of disadvantaging the in, like the bigger names who want to go in and sell memberships, right? Because I'm yeah. if I'm Doug Ford, I don't want any of those leadership candidates coming into my into my province during this uh, election because you're going to be you taking take up the atmosphere. Way, yeah, if you take it that way, sure. Um, 100 percent but i'm thinking you know after the campaign well after that as well um you know but during the campaign so that's why you need to be extremely well organized on the ground so i know for a fact that that there are some campaigns right now that have there's prices for the writing that sells the most memberships this week there's writing you know there's People, so there's a lot that we do not see that is the organization part. So you're going to have a provincial, a national organizer, then you're going to have provincial organizers, then you're going to have writing local volunteers are going to be making sure to try to sell as many memberships as you can. So it's going to be interesting to see how, I don't think it will fully disadvantage them. I think it will give them, so because the leader doesn't really sell the memberships. Sure, they're going to have a table, buy your membership, give us 10 bucks, off we go. But the real ground game is at the organization level with every writing. So we're going to see what's going to happen. But I know that some campaigns, they have well over 500 volunteers right now 
which is quite a bit. So some campaigns are better organized than others. So, but if the conservative leaders are smart, they're gonna try to focus on the West because we do not know what is going to hit us in a little bit. And then they're gonna go back to Ontario and Quebec, I would say, June, July, August, they're gonna be focusing. We're not gonna see them here. They're gonna be working their ground game over there. But yeah, that, they're, they're selling memberships right now. The memberships number have not really come out yet, but I'm hearing that they're not extremely, no, they're not spectacular. And like a lot of pre people are pretend, like there's, it's slow. Well, I can tell you, I have gone to five of the six leadership candidates uh, events here in the city of California yeah. over the last month. And as you go in, you have to sign your name in and ask, they ask you for your email. And I thought, okay, well, I'm coming in just in case I'll put my email address down because it's always great to see what people send you. I've never gotten yeah. more membership requests from every single email from every single party because they are trying. And with the way that the world works right now of the voter apathy and volunteer apathy a bit, it's hard to get people engaged. So you have to hit them where they count. Like I got one from it, Bears camp today. I got one from Romans yeah. yesterday. I got one from John Shrey's the day before that. It seems like every day it's like, who am I going to get tomorrow? Is it going to be like Patrick Brown's? No, because he hasn't sent one email to me. <laughs> yeah. It's Brown's campaign is a little different. It's very under the radar kind of vibe right now, which is quite spectacular. Um, but, you know, we need to remember that it doesn't matter how many people you have at your rally. It doesn't mean they're going to buy vote. It doesn't mean they're going to make donations. Well, Everything happens in the background. I'm so happy you so, said that. I just had a conversation and it's coming out on Monday. The, yeah. the, the leader of the CEO of Take Back Alberta is doing a tour of across Alberta right now where he's talking to Albertans to say buy membership yeah. in the UCP and vote prior to the April 8th uh, change. And he said it's, it's, it's surprising that how many people have memberships in parties is very low compared to what you would think. So the people who are actually making the decision of who the next leader of the conservative party is going to be is probably like 1% of the population. And of that 1% who buy memberships, about 75% of those will actually get out and vote. And that's the voter apathy issue that the conservatives have to deal with as well, because you can bring all the rally members you want, but unless they don't like actually buy a membership and vote, that rally means jack squat. <laughs> well, and also you can sell a million memberships in Alberta. It won't guarantee you more seats. Yeah. And that's something that a lot of people, I, I feel like sometimes a lot of people are missing that point is that, okay, you're strong out West, but if you're dead squat in the 905 and Quebec won't listen to you, you're dead in the water. So there's a very fine balance. It's great to sell memberships, but you need to be strategic on where you want to sell your memberships too. You want to sell more memberships in Quebec and Ontario. Alberta, if you sell 40,000 or 500,000, it's not going to make a difference. It's not going to give you more elect. You're not going to be more electable as a party if you're extremely strong in Alberta because we have the same amount of seats and it's not going to change. I agree so. wholeheartedly. Actually, that's untrue. I can't agree with that because the Elections Commission is coming out with their recommendations for 34 seats in the province of Alberta. So we are technically gaining two seats here. So woo, two extra seats. We shall see. Amen Who's to that. Who's going to get elected next? That's my question. Through that. Hey, unless they split up Calgary Skyview, it might get two liberals. Who knows? Um, but I want to stick close to Ontario here because I think we've talked yeah. about, hey, I, I live in Skyview, so I'm willing to chat about, hey, if we split up that rod, you could get two liberals. You might make a dent into people being pissed off at two people instead of one in the province, in the city of Calgary. So it's all good. Um, hey, I can say that I ran for the liberals. <laughs> <laughs> 
thoughts. Let's talk about uh, the 905, the GTA Ontario. We talked about Doug Ford a little bit, but I want to stick on that because that is the big political news across the, the country right now is Ontario is heading to an election on June 2nd after not surprisingly months of delays and waiting until the very last minute to call the election. Doug Ford is going to elect the uh, going to the voters to ask for a second mandate under the m- mantra Get it done with Doug Ford. Don't know who Get her done. Get her done, as uh, Larry the Cable Guy would say. Maybe that's what they're trying to do. There you go. Then Stephen Del Duca should come out with the here's your sign from Bill Angvil. And then Andrew Horvath, you know you're a redneck when. See, it all works. Get the blue collar comedy tour back together on the Ontario election campaign. Mike Schneider could be Ron White getting completely shit faced drunk. It's awesome. (laughs) This is what we talk about at 830 at night. (laughs) No, so. What's fascinating with Ford is that he has managed to create a brand for himself and dissociate himself from the conservatives. Exactly. So there's, it's fascinating that I, the dude is able to dissociate himself from his party. Fascinating. It's not because the when progressive you think, conservatives. It is the Ford party. It is, uh, it is what the is Ford, it, like Ford Nation? Nation? There you go. It's Ford Nation. So when you look at Trudeau, well, them liberal, or he's a liberal, when you look at the CAQ, or you look at Charest, you're like, oh, well, that dude was a liberal, but in theory, he's conservative. But that's a discussion for another week. We'll talk about um, that in a few weeks if you want. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you look at, you know, in BC, and, all and if you look at Jason Kenney, we're like, well, he's the UCP. Yeah. It's fascinating on how much of a difference there is in polling favorable to Doug Ford and favorable to the PC. It's fascinating. The guy is really, really good at marketing himself. We Does, will give him that. So you are uh, relatively... Uh, well known in conservative circles you have talked to conservatives you have conservative friends mm-hmm. I have conservative friends as well but yeah. my conservative friends are more on the hey we voted conservative once and that's it that's how they're conservatives in that sense I want to ask this question because you you you've watched the last two federal elections Andrew Shearer and Aaron O'Toole both told Doug Ford to take a hike do not pop your head out during the election. They, they put him in hiding. For exactly. 40 days. Does yeah. Doug Ford turn around and say that to the leadership candidates who are running in for their leadership and say, take a hike? And I asked you this. I, I sort of mentioned it beforehand, but I want to ask you point blank because I think he's going to. I think he's I think he's pissed off at the federal conservatives because they are not polling well. In, well, they're polling well uh, nationally, but not in Ontario. And they're polling well. Exactly. The more votes you get in Alberta doesn't mean you get the more seats you get across the nation. So let's just be honest there. I agree with that. Let's see, you know, with the representation and, uh, you know, the distribution of, um, you know, calls here when you're doing a poll, if you're, if you have 40% of the calls are being made in Alberta, your results will be skewed, right? No, understandable. And I appreciate that. But I want to know, because I think he's going to, I think he's probably told all the campaigns to lay low, do not try. And this is why they'll come out to Western Alberta, Canada to to, uh, sort of shore up support out here. And It's a Donald Trump show. It's for Nation. He went through extremely difficult two, two years with, uh, you know, the long-term care facility, COVID fiasco. Um, Kids are super sick right now in Ontario, uh, flip-flopping on uh, restrictions, really trying to get her done. But, you know, you see that the guy guy really wants to do something, but he's kind of trying to hold out into his conservative belief that smaller government, less implication, personal responsibility and whatnot. So the guy, the guy's all about customer service. This guy's brand is customer service. He wants his electors to be happy. And I think that's why he's trying to dissociate himself so much from the PCs 
It's because he sees himself. It's like the president of the United States. He is a Democrat. He is a Republican, but he is his own person, right? So it's going to be interesting to see how, as a party, how they're going to be polling in two weeks and how as a premier he is going to be polling in two weeks because the dude has got that one right. We got to give him customer service and dissociating himself from his own party is quite a flex. So it's going to be, I, I think he's going to tell them to go pound sand and be like, no, you know what? This is my show right now. You ask me to sit the ones out before do me a favor. He's, because he's we probably don't really more know. popular than John Schrey, Pierre Polyver, all of the leadership candidates who are running for the Conservative Party in Ontario. Because let's be honest, and this is where I think yeah. I, I will call uh, call it out. The, the 2018 election was not Doug Ford's win. It was yeah. we hate Kathleen Wynne so much we want her out no matter who is the uh, who is the choice. There was chances yeah. that we had Andrea Horvath as premier right now, but more people said, you know what? We liked Rob Ford as much as he was kind of scandal ridden. We liked him, but we liked Doug as well. So we'll give Doug a chance because it's the conservative brand and he seems like he's a straight shooting guy who is willing to tell me exactly what he's going to do, even though we don't believe him. Well, what's, what's interesting right now is that the progressive have a massive issue right now. They're splitting the vote. I know everybody hates talking about vote splitting, but if you do the math, they would get 54% of the vote if they would create an alliance and the PCPO would get 37%, you know, which is not that great. Um, but I... The thing is that with Ford right now, I do not know, I'm not able to pinpoint who he aligns with more. I think he's waiting and see to see how everything's gonna play out in his own backyard before he start getting involved at the national level. But we need to remember that Ford's a conservative, but Ford is not a conservative. He is not a regular conservative. He's not a, you know, uh, like Brian Jean or, you know, Jason Kenney or Michelle Rempel. Uh, Ford decided one day, announced out of his mom's basement and wanted to run and he got it done. So Ford is not the norm. So it's going to be extremely interesting to see. But right now, the progressives are just, you know. I, I agree. The Liberals and the NDP are in disarray right now. Stephen yeah. DeLuca is not a well-known entity in Ontario. I worked at Queen's Park. I don't remember him. And that tells you something about his, uh, like his personality. He's not remarkable. He doesn't create memories. He doesn't spark joy. He doesn't create. So what we need to remember, too, is that leaders, leaders need to leave an impression. And leaders need to create emotions. So when you're not able to reach and have that emotional language food, like and that creates strong emotions like taglines, um, then you're at a very, very, very strong disadvantage against your adversaries. And Mr. Ford, once again, like his buck a beer thing, everybody was laughing at him. Yeah. And then we're seeing the lips are trying to do the same thing with bucket transit. Yeah. So you know, the, the guy created a branding, he created a way to get it done. And some people are trying to replicate it. And I think it's going to backfire on them. I agree wholeheartedly. Doug Ford is a unique entity. There's not a lot of politicians who are like uh, Doug Ford in this country. Or but also, also Doug Ford announced the creation of a EV plant. And, you know, he's being more progressive dog for it is a mystery and he's so well the right fact like, that like i i could not imagine jason kenny and justin trudeau standing side by side without the grimaces that they had on during that uh, ten dollar day daycare like when Doug Ford and Justin Trudeau were standing side by side for the EV announcement in Windsor on Monday, a day before the election call, they looked like they were like good old friends. They had just they hadn't seen each other in a few weeks. They're like, "Hey, buddy, what's up?" Like Doug and Ford you probably invited him to have a beer after or have some cherry pie at his cottage or something, right? 
the guy has an image of a good guy and he's so Doug Ford right now is trying to represent that he's trying to do what is right for the province. They had two shitty year. They were way over their head. And he kind of recognized that, recognizes that too. So, you know, with Christine Elliott not running and, and there's a lot of his entourage is going to be changing. So, but Ford wants to have the image of the good guy. But again, the 413 announcement is a little sketchy, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, that would just need a whole you know, hour in itself, but that would not it, go over well. It's, it's, it's but, interesting. So I think he's going to go in again. Oh, I think so too. I think I think he's he gonna win. I think the Liberals are gonna gain some seats. I think the NDP are gonna lose. It's not gonna be as big as a big of majority as it is right now, but I I'm looking forward uh, as people have been tuning into the cross border interviews with Chris Brown Monday to Friday, 15 days a month. Um, we are going back in the uh, second last week before the election, and we're going to be uh, crisscrossing the province, and we're going to be talking to some of the candidates. We've lined up interviews. We're going to be live streaming some of that. So please tune in because we're going to give some reports on the ground, and it's going to be fun, fun, fun. Um, but I want to end on the biggest on, on on some news close to home. We are now in May. We are now May 4th, 14 Fourth. days Happy away Friday. from the leadership review of Jason Kenney. Mm -hmm. The last few weeks has not gone over well for Jason Kenney and the UCP. And we have seen MLAs come out and publicly publicly call for his resignation peter guthrie yeah. uh red deer north i forget the gentleman's name who is the mla that tells you how much he has made an impression on me over the last three years um yeah, i don't oh my god i don't know exactly Stephen. it's Stephen. yeah Stephen. something i don't know his last name um, and we have seen the president of Calgary Hayes, Rick McIver's writing, resign. Very close ally to Jason Kenney, saying he doesn't have faith in the party anymore. Leela here. Leela here. R Richard Godfrey. I, I, if you look at the legislature, legislative seating plan, which I did the moment that they got, got back, Brian Jean, uh, Grant Hunter, Leela here are all by each other in the back left-hand corner. Like, to me, that is the greatest spot to be because I would just love to be a fly on the wall back there just to hear the conversations as Jason Kenney stands up and talks and just listening to him probably boo yeah. or, like, mean girls it. They're there. They're there. Um, but it's going to be fascinating to see what is going to happen because we need to remember that a lot of people... So there was there was that kind of movement that people kind of went in, being like, "Hey, I'm going to buy a UCP membership to vote Kenny out." So the numbers are inflated. Yeah. The membership numbers are so huge, so it could go both ways. So it is fascinating because people became UCP members in spite of their leader because they don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. So, you know, voters of this province kind of took it to their own hand and said, hey, you know what? Maybe we should just buy a membership, get it done. It's going to be interesting. Vitor has been extremely vocal recently. Um, there's a lot, you know, Nila here has been extremely vocal. More and more people are kind of trying to... A lot... Of, so here's the thing. A lot of people are getting closer. A lot of people are getting more distance. So it's going to be interesting to see what is going to happen. I don't have a, my crystal ball is broken. I yeah. think he's going to win it. I think our crystal ball but, both broke on the day the by-election was called in uh, Fort McMurray, uh, Lac La Biche, and we both were wrong on how close or how far apart it was going to be. Because I think I made a very stunning, incorrect uh, statement, and you looked at me and said, it's going to be closer than that, or it's going to be further away than that. And I was like, nope, it's going to be very close. It's going to be like 30 to 20, and he, not even close. So what is, what's going to be interesting, so to me, like, it was a dead cannon table when uh, <laughs> they 
put in mailing ballots. That that was the one that really did it for me. So we're going to see what's happening. Um, we are starting to see who is extremely loyal to the premier and who is not so much. So it's going to be too interesting to see what's going to be happening after to see uh, what the aftermath of the leadership review will be. I have a theory, but I'm not sure I'm ready to process it. <laughs> so there are many options that are, and I, I'll, 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 I'll grill them, everyone who's listening to this on Friday or right now or later on, on Thursday or yeah. later on. I will grill her and release it via Twitter what she said to me. Joking, I won't, because I respect everyone. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I, there's many options that are potentially good. There's many, many solutions or many options uh, scenarios that are playing out right now jason kenny yeah. wins big majority win jason kenny wins with a very small minority or majority like 51 50 to 60 percent to me is a small majority win anything above 60 he i think he has a relatively good confidence of the party and he can move mm -hmm. forward anything mm -hmm. below well anything below 50 percent is a fail and he ha he doesn't technically have to step down as premier but he has to step down as leader of the party according to their constitution for those who want to just say no he doesn't have to step down it's true he doesn't have to step down as premier he can stay on as premier but that'd be a very big constitutional crisis that we have on our hands there <laughs> Never and no more. the other one is he loses but he doesn't accept the results. And so go ahead. He he did say that he was going to respect the results. <clears throat> I think he said he was um, going to respect the fact that we were supposed to have a, a vote on April 9th. I think it's May. Now. <laughs> so May, whatever. So I yeah. I think he will there's respect it, history. but there's all these there's different things. History. Yeah, and there's a history of he's, something is going to be said, something's going to be planned, and then, oops, it's uh, not happening anymore. So uh, there's a few there's a few scenarios. So he wins below 75, and the party kicks him out because they could judge that it's not strong enough. Do you remember what Klein got? Do you know what Klein got in his review when he got sort of not turf? But I thought it was like 55%, wasn't it? But I I know that Redford got 77 and she stepped down. But she stepped so down bar, after there was a few scandals around Redford that were going yeah, on. Yeah, well, there's a few scandals happening right now. You know, what there, are you talking there's about? a lot. Jason Kenny's Teflon. He can't get hurt. He can, he can go drink with Jason. Water Redford. on the box back. Just, oh, Jinx monsooning but, it, are we? Um, so, but it's there's so many things that could happen. We could see a lot of people, let's say if he wins with 65, 68, 70 percent, a lot of people could cross the floor or he would think that, you know, he really wants the team of his team of loyalists. So he could call a snap. There's so many things that could happen. It's going to be a fun few weeks. I'm going to leave on this question because this is the question I've been pondering to myself for the last few weeks. I again going back to that conservative leadership race. Yeah. The federal one. I've been to yeah. the majority of the events that have been held in the city. I think I missed one Grant Abrams, who's no longer a candidate, but the major candidates who have been here, I've uh, been at the events. Not one of them, not one mentioned Jason Kenny. In the 2020 leadership race, Jason Kenney's endorsement of Aaron O'Toole put Aaron O'Toole in a front rudder position against Peter McKay. Mm -hmm. This time, the candidates seem like they are so... Who is Jason Kenney? I don't know who Jason Kenney is. If Jason Kenney wins the leadership race or review, do all the candidates come out west because of the Ontario election and embrace them like they've never embraced a, a premier ever because, or does Jason Kenny no longer have the sway in federal politics that he once did in 2020? Jason Kenny is not the man he used to be 10 years ago. And Jason Kenny is not the man he was six years ago. Um, he's, I would say that, you know, when I said that, you know, a lot of conservatives right now are str struggling with their, 
conservative identities if they're more conservative red Tories or populists um because let's be honest we are dealing with some serious populism in the province right now um you know he might not be the flavor of the week anymore he might not be the kid that, that you know that has the midest touch and that everything he touches turns into gold so it's going to be interesting to see what is going to happen and which. So I, I've heard a rumor that Mr. Poryev was supposed, I don't know if it's true, but Jason Kenney was winning on an endorsement from, you know, our candidate and it never happened. Um, I'm wondering if uh, currently right now, Mr. Kenney is too controversial. I'm not going to say problematic, but controversial and, uh, you know, aligning with him pre, uh, you know, uh, leadership writ could be risky. So it's gonna be interesting to see what is going to happen after, but I can tell you that there's a lot of conservatives that will be extremely frustrated and things might not end up the way we think they might end up. So it's gonna I'm be TBD. You, I, I'm glad you said that because I wanna end on this note and that is, I was at the Pierre Polyev event and I was at the Les and Lou's event. There was two people there with the say yes to Kenny buttons on their lapel pins, which was the say yes, we want to keep Jason Kenny. Mm -hmm. The amount of attention that they got from the attendees was mind blowing. And it wasn't in the positive. People coming up and saying, why would we say yes to Jason Kenny? What has he done for us? So on and so forth. And I, I it, that's what brought me to that question that I asked is because are people, are conservatives just holding their breath right now and hoping that this gets resolved on the 18th and just just expecting that everything, everyone's going to get together and be united again? Or are people going to be divided more than they are right now heading into the leadership review? And I'll end on that question that, with you. So right now... So I'm just gonna go back a few months, uh, back in October, I would say. Um, dear, a friend of mine and I went to uh, the UCP leadership and when they realized, uh, the UCP convention, and when they realized who we were, they ran after us and revoked our media passes. But that's a story for another day. Um, so, and there was a lot of people working the crowd with the yes for Kenny button. Yes, we support the leader. A lot of people were saying, nah, man, thanks. So I would say that Jason Kenny is one of the rare conservative leaders that has been to be able to polarize both, side of, both sides of conservatism. He's pissed off the populace and he's pissed off the centrist or the red Tories. So yeah, we shall see. We, we shall see. Um, I want to do a quick plug here for myself and for the show. Uh, before we wrap up with Sarah, and that is uh, May is Brain Tumor Awareness uh, Brain Tumor Awareness Month across Canada and around the world. Uh, we have pledged that all donations to the show during the month of May will go directly to the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. It is a great organization. On June 11th, we will be doing a big walk virtually, which means that we will be starting a walk on June 11th, and we will see wherever we get to. Raising money along the way to help find cures for people struggling with brain tumors. As you might know, as you if, if you've listened to the show before, if you listened during the municipal campaign, I've been struggling with a brain tumor for a few years. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I can say a few years now. That's daunting in the end of the day. Um, I would highly recommend if you have five dollars, ten dollars, two dollars, a dollar, donate to the brain, uh, uh, the Brain Tumor Foundation uh, of Canada. The links will be in the show notes. Highly recommend you do. Um, but Sarah, uh, this is our first of many conversations that you and I are going to have here. Uh, as I said at the top of the show, we are going to be bringing on some great guests to come on the show and be grilled by Sarah and I over the next few weeks, few months, few years uh, about what's going on in the political realm, in their party, in their uh, riding, in their constituency. And we will have other political pundits join us as well from time to time. So, Sarah, uh, my last question. Uh, what are you looking forward to next week? Anything in particular on May 11th? <laughs> uh, I'm going to be in Ottawa. Uh, at Ottawa. 
Good God, I'm <laughs> tired. I'm going to be in Edmonton covering. Um, so I'm going to be doing uh, coverage from French CBC, for French CBC. I'm going to be doing some uh, videos with French CBC about the conservative leadership debate. And then the day after, we're going to be filming a series on the environment. So it's going to be, um, you know, conservatives and environment. So I'm looking very much forward to it. It's going to, it's going to be great. It's awesome. Be and next week, next Wednesday, we will be live well, right well, after well, the well, leadership. Well, Yes, the leadership debate. Uh, Sarah will try to join us. We do have a few other uh, commentators who are going to be yeah. coming on Point of Order on May 11th. Point of Order on May 11th. Yeah, that's right. That's a really tongue twister. Yeah. Um, Sarah, as always, a pleasure. The links to her Twitter and social media pages are down below. So please check them out. For everyone here at the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, this has been the first inaugural episode of Point of Order live on YouTube, released via audio on Friday. Talk to you later, guys. <laughs>